Hello, and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver, and I'm a scientist, and this is Cindy Oliver, and she's a dog. Now, recently, Dr. John Campbell published a video entitled Trickle of Truth. However, after watching it, a better title would be Tsunami of Lies. Let's have a listen to a few bits. Uh, studies have shown an increased risk of myocarditis after vaccination with mRNA, mRNA encoding SARS coronavirus 2 spike protein. This is well known already, but it does reiterate it. Good to see this in the sort of more official literature. No idea what he means when he says it's good to see it in the official literature. I did a quick PubMed search and found 1,735 results for vaccine myocarditis. It's well and truly covered in the official literature. And we also know that the incidence of myocarditis is much lower following vaccination than following COVID. And the severity of myocarditis is also much lower following vaccination than following COVID or other viral infections. There is concern that COVID vaccination per se might contribute to long COVID. Well, there we have it. This is an official medical journal. And they're now saying there is a concern. See what I mean? They're kind of letting it out drip by drip, I think. That COVID-19 vaccination per se might contribute to long COVID. Let me know what you think. I would have thought that's a debate that's done and dusted a long time ago. But good to see that that is in the official literature. They go on. And again, we've given the rest reference for that. They're giving rise to the colloquial term long vax. Um, I'll put the reference there for it, but we did think of that a long time ago, as, as did many others, because it's such a self-evident uh, description of this. When John says an official medical journal is saying this, he's talking bollocks. The journal makes it very clear that that is not the case. Let me just read their disclaimer for you. The views expressed by the authors of articles in Australian Journal of General Practice are their own and not necessarily those of the publisher or the editorial staff and must not be quoted as such. Every care is taken to reproduce articles accurately, but the publisher accepts no responsibility for errors, omissions or inaccuracies contained therein or for the consequences of any action taken by any person as a result of anything contained in this publication. And indeed, when we look at the link that the author used to support his statement that there is concern that COVID-19 vaccination per se might contribute to long COVID, giving rise to the colloquial term long vax, we see that it is an article entitled Vaccines May Cause Rare. COVID-like symptoms. COVID-19 vaccines utilise a modified stabilised perfusion spike protein that might share similar toxic effects with its viral counterparts. Toxic effects of the spike protein induced by vaccination, again, uh, being slipped into the text there. Now, what they're talking about here is that the uridine is one of the bases, and it's the, the one in the um, vaccine is not the natural uridine. Now, they say it's... Uh, uh, utilise a modified stabilised perfusion spike protein. <laughs> uh, in other words, um, that sounds better than saying it's an unnatural uh, RNA uh, base, which it is. Oh dear, this is just embarrassingly wrong. To start with, unless the author is as clueless as John, he's not talking about pseudouridine when he mentions stabilised perfusion spike protein. They are completely different things. When the COVID virus fuses to a cell, it switches from a pre-fusion state to a post-fusion state in order to enter the cell. The spike protein produced by mRNA vaccines is stabilised in a pre-fusion state, so it can't change to the post-fusion state necessary for cell entry with the virus. This makes it better for producing neutralising antibodies. As for pseudouridine, John is also incorrect when he says it isn't natural. It is. In fact, RNA from mammalian cells frequently contains pseudouridine, whereas prior to this breakthrough, synthesised mRNA contained uridine. 
What's more, the inflammatory response was almost abolished when these natural base modifications were included in synthesized mRNA. Right, the article goes on. A possible association between COVID-19 vaccination and the incidence of POTS has been demonstrated in a cohort of 284,592 COVID-19 vaccinated individuals. So this thing, POTS, has been seen in people who've had the COVID vaccines. For some strange reason, John has cut this sentence off. The complete sentence is, a possible association between COVID-19 vaccination and the incidence of POTS has been demonstrated in a cohort of 284,592 COVID-19 vaccinated individuals, though at a rate that was one-fifth of the incidence of POTS after SARS-CoV-2 infection. mRNA vaccines can result in spike protein expression in and this is from the article, muscle tissue, and it doesn't say where, but presumably all around the world, lymphatic system, all around the body rather, well, all around, in people's bodies all around the world, in muscle tissue, lymphatic system, and the lymphatic system, of course, is um, is all over the body, um, your tonsils, your appendix, uh, thymus, spleen, but all over, under your armpits and your groin, there's lymph nodes, it's, it's all over the body. In, in your thumb, there's untold numbers of uh, lymphatic vessels all, all over the body. So very, very systemic manifestation, lymphatic system. Cardiomyocytes, these are specifically the cells in the myocardium of the heart. Um, and these can, uh, mRNA vaccine can result in spike protein expression in cardiac myocytes. This is very, very bad news indeed. Uh, other cells enter into the circulation and basically can go anywhere. And we've looked at literature various times on this channel, pointing out that this goes into places where you really wouldn't want the spike protein coding mRNA to go, to put it mildly. This statement does come from the article, but it's bollocks. The reference used to back up the statement is this article here, which hypothesises that spike protein may be involved in vaccine adverse effects. But it doesn't provide any actual evidence that this is the case. Most importantly, it makes no mention whatsoever of cardiomyocytes producing spike protein from mRNA vaccines. And that's not surprising because there is no evidence that cardiomyocytes can translate mRNA into spike protein. Furthermore, although trace amounts of mRNA have been found in the circulation of some people, there is no evidence that it is functional. In fact, in most cases, we know it's not functional because only fragments are found. We also know that not all cells actually translate mRNA to spike protein. And in vivo, it is mainly translated by monocytes and dendritic cells at the injection site and draining lymph nodes. Uh, recipients of two or more injections of the mRNA vaccines display a class switch to immunoglobulin type 4 antibodies. Now, we've looked at these before. These, have the, uh, these will reduce the immune response. So it's an example where giving vaccines will reduce immunity. Go figure why we would want to do that. I suppose someone's making money out of it, but um, I'm not quite sure why you would want to reduce immunity with uh, vaccination. But abnormal high levels of IgG4, immunoglobulin, Ig immunoglobulin G4, the type, produced normally after about a week or two weeks after exposure. Um, now, this again, this is directly from this article, might cause autoimmune disease. Disease. Disease is dis-ease. So you are not at ease. Dis-abnormal. State of abnormal ease. Dis-ease. Promote cancer growth. And again, this is being kind of, is this just being trickled out in this article? Promote cancer growth. That's what they say. It can promote cancer growth. More IgG4 bollocks. It is a favourite talking point of anti-vaxxers. The paper used by the author to substantiate the ridiculous claims he makes about IgG4 is a paper written by anti-vaxxers published in an unreliable journal. 
The actual scientific literature in reputable journals paints a different story. I'll just read this abstract to you. Repeated doses of mRNA vaccines for COVID-19 result in increased proportions of anti-spike antibodies of the IgG4 subclass, which are known to neutralise well and to form mixed immune complexes with IgG1, but in a pure form might be less effective than IgG1 or IgG3 antibodies in facilitating oponization by phagocytes complement fixation and NK cell dependent elimination of infected cells. And it's important to note that this class, which is only for antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, antibodies to other antigens that are not related to SARS-CoV-2 are not affected. And this is important because claims trying to link increased IgG4 antibodies to various other conditions like cancer and autoimmunity would only be relevant if the class switch was across all antibodies. A few other important things to note are IgG4 antibodies also form after infection, including in those who haven't been vaccinated. And although there is a switch to more IgG4 antibodies, other classes of antibodies are still produced. Incidentally, one group of people where class switching to IgG4 antibodies is seen is beekeepers. They see it in antibodies to bee venom. This study that looked at cancer mortality amongst beekeepers did not show an increase in cancer mortality. They also didn't see any unusual patterns in mortality from other causes. And regarding autoimmunity claims, this study, which was published in Nature Communications, shows that the COVID mRNA vaccines are not associated with autoimmunity, but SARS-CoV-2 infection is. We also know that vaccination can reduce your risk of developing a number of autoimmune diseases following COVID, including grave disease, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, immune-mediated thrombocytopenia, lupus, and autoimmune arthritis. Millions worldwide experience post-acute sequelae of COVID-19 or um, post-vaccine. This is millions of people around the world. No, the paper doesn't say millions of people suffer from post-COVID or post-vaccine sequelae. It says millions suffer from post-COVID sequelae. John's just ad-libbing. Just a reminder, the reference used to support the claim of post-vaccine sequelae specifically says that they are rare. And there are also a large number of studies showing that vaccination reduces the incidence of long COVID following SARS-CoV-2 infection, including this one, which was published recently in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine. Uh, the median duration of long COVID symptoms is five months, but 10% of patients still experience symptoms at 12 months. Of course, 10% of all those that are vaccinated is a massive number. 10% of those vaccinated is a massive number. But the number has nothing whatsoever to do with the statement that John has highlighted which refers to the percentage of people with long COVID who still have symptoms after 12 months. It's like he's decided on a story that will appeal to his audience and he's just bending unrelated facts to fit it. A few people have made a few billion out of this recent pandemic. Maybe they'd like to chip in and help these people. Who, who, know, who knows? I must say I agree with the sentiment that John is expressing here. In fact, a few more people have made millions from the pandemic. Perhaps they could chip in too. In summary, John's found a paper that makes claims that aren't supported by the references that it used, and then he's added further bollocks on top of that. If you'd like to look further into the data I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember, this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. 
If you've got this far, thank you for listening. And if you've liked, shared or commented on the video, double thank you because that helps the algorithm and means that more people will see the video. And, of course, thank you to everyone who has bought me a coffee or little Cindy here a treat. And I'll just give her one that you've all helped with your support. And we do really appreciate your support. We will be continuing to make videos about the science in the future. So if you'd like to join the Cool Kids and stay informed, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.